as a child, uh, and I, I will admit I can't even remember the name of it, but there were wizards in it. Um, and little, you know, it was, it was one of your, your classic fantasy books, uh, similar to Lord of the Rings. Um, <clears throat> excuse Harry me. Potter? No. Um, but there were these magicians and wizards and whatnot, and one of the things they could do, or there was a, a, a new wizard, is the one you were following along in the book. He has discovered that he has these powers. And of course, in any of these stories, you have a mentor who comes along and trains him up in the ways of wizardry or, or, or magic and whatever. And, uh, one of the things he says when he puts him to the first test is there's this large boulder, uh, you know, taller than me, huge boulder, several, hundred, several dozen tons at least. And he said, move the boulder. And the kid's like, ah, I have no idea. So he tries pushing it with his magic power. He just ends up pushing himself back into the, uh, into the muck and the mud. Um, he tries, tries getting on top of it and sort of like finagling it that way. doesn't work. Tries lifting it. Again, pushes himself back into the, into the ground. And the guy says, all right, we'll come back to this. So he goes off and he, he excels in a whole bunch of other ways. You know, he can, he can create fire. He can, he can float a little bit, all this sort of stuff. But he cannot move the boulder. Finally, after just a long time of training and lots of beating his head against the wall or the boulder for that matter, um, the, 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 the young magician's a uh, mentor says, all right, let me, let, me, let me try to help you out with this. And he snaps his fingers and turns the boulder into feathers. He says, go right ahead. And of course, he can do it with ease. In order to do what, he had, what had to be done, in order to do what he needed to do, the boulder had to change what it was. He had to change the boulder from what it was into something different. If you would open with me to Romans chapter 6, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 4. <laughs> be quiet, Dave. <laughs> so, as you're opening to Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, uh, let me say first and foremost, congratulations, we've made it out of the dark and we're moving into the light part of, yes. uh, light part of Romans yes. here. Yes. Um, <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah and amen to that. So we've just come from, uh, Pastor gave a sermon last week about how uh, we had Adam's sin that brought a reign of death, and then it was juxtaposed to Christ's obedience, which brings a new reign of life and a promise amen. for eternal life. Amen. Um, and actually, as we read here, you're going to notice that something will tickle your, the, the back of your ear and say, haven't we read this part before? Back in Romans 3, 5 to 8. There was a similar question that arose, and I'll, I'll get to reading this in just a moment. Romans 3, 5 to 8, Paul says this. He's, he's speaking rhetorically. He goes, but if our righteousness brings about God, sorry, if our unrighteousness, unrighteousness brings about God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say, that God is unjust in bringing his wrath on us? This is a rhetorical question that Paul uses back in Romans 3, and the, the, the end the end of that passage is Paul really hammering home to all who would bring this objection. It's like, no, the, 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 uh, the end result is you are a sinner. You're trying to escape culpability for your sin. You are a sinner. You cannot escape culpability for your own sin. That was the end of that rhetorical question. Now we come here to another rhetorical question at the beginning of chapter 6. And notice it has a different ending um, here. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, I will read verses 1 through 4, then we'll go back through. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Remember from Romans 5, 20, the law, added so the, the, law, the law was added so that trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So we have this. This is, this, this is the question in response to that. So, where sin increased, grace increased all the more. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? And Paul, in true Paul form, by no means, or God forbid, or may it never be. By no means, we died to sin, how can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of God the Father, through, excuse me, through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. <clears throat> and so we have here a progression from the old life into the new life. The ending here, the ending to this passage, the ending to this rhetorical question is not, you are a sinner. The ending to this rhetorical question is, you are changed 
in some way. And we'll get into exactly what that looks like here. So we have the question itself. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? I will say here, normally I like the, the NIV translation. This one's, it's a little bit wonky. A, a really firm, good translation of this might say something to the effect of, what shall we say then? Shall we go on abiding with the sin? <clears throat> is, is how the Greek lays out. Shall we go on abiding with the sin? So it's not a matter of like, will you keep sinning? It's like, yes. I mean, I think all of us in here can say that even though we are Christians, we, we still sin. <clears throat> Will we go on abiding with the sinful nature is sort of the, the, the best way to, to, to look at this here. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So uh, in, generally it's accepted that this question that Paul is raising comes out of either legalists who are trying to poke holes in Paul for his doctrine yeah. of grace or from, uh, again, big fancy word, we've used it earlier, antinomians, those who say, I'm saved in Christ, therefore I can do anything that I want. There is no law over me anymore. Um, and, you know, these people trying to just get away with more. I think we can all agree, we as human beings, one of our core motivations is how much can I get away with before I'm doing something wrong. Sinful yes, that's, the sin, that's, the, that's that sinful nature. Yeah. So, <clears throat> it is not literally, shall we go on, shall we continue sinning? It is literally, shall we continue to abide with sin? And abide, again, is, it sort of denotes... Uh, a friendly, cordial existence. Uh, you know, I, I abide with my wife. I live with my wife cordially, usually. Um, <laughs> Except when I ask for hand motions for songs, yeah. So again, it is not, will you sin after you're saved? Rather, the question is, what is your relationship with sin after you have been saved? So, uh, the question raised then, a... Shall we remain in good relationship with sin so that God's grace can increase? That's the question here. Shall we remain in good relationship with sin so that God's grace can increase? <clears throat> Excuse me. And so you have, you know, what does Paul say here? Well, first of all, the question actually assumes that we have abided in sinful nature. Um, we've talked about this in Sunday school. You are... You are not a sinner because you sin. You sin because you are a sinner. You have a sinful nature in you. Sin reigned over you before Christ. Sin had a hold over you. Mm -hmm. um, and so, <clears throat> excuse me, you had to sin. It was inevitable that you were going to sin because of the sinful nature within you. Furthermore, because of that sinful nature, you enjoyed it. You enjoyed doing that sin. And actually, and that, that's you know, what sort of compounds over and over and over again where we get to that a corrupt conscience that, again, we read about earlier in Romans. Mm -hmm. So the question then really is this. If more sin equals more grace, and more grace equals more glory for God, then more sin equals more glory for God. Therefore, more sin is good. That's, that's what's being posed to Paul. Yeah. Yeah. That's what's being posed to Paul. So essentially, it is a question of outcomes. It's a question of, even though I'm doing wickedness over here, good is resulting... So isn't that ultimately a good thing to do? It's a question of outcomes. And so they're asking a question of outcomes. You would expect an answer of outcomes from Paul. You would expect something to the effect of, no, that's not how that works, because actually sinning does not bring glory to God, even though grace increases. You would expect that kind of answer, because it's taking their question of outcomes, and it's correcting the answer. It's correcting the answer to an answer of outcomes. Mm -hmm. Rather, the answer given is different. What does Paul say? By no means, so the answer is no, but why? We died to sin, how can we live in it any longer? We died to sin, how can we abide with it any longer? Yeah. So it's not an answer given for outcomes, it's an answer given of category. You have changed as a person. You no longer abide with sin it is impossible because you have changed as a person to continue to abide with sin. It's not a matter of like, he's not saying now you shouldn't sin. Yes. He's saying now you cannot abide with sin any longer. Very good. He's not calling for a change of behavior. He is stating that you, it is a change of person. Yes. It Thanks. is a change of person. 
And again, I'd say everyone in here has had sin in their lives. Again, we know from Romans, earlier in Romans, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Even after we have come to Christ and we have been saved by the bloody, bu- the bloody, the body and blood of Christ, <clears throat> 1 John 1.8 says this, if we say that we have no sin, and he's writing to believers, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Mm-hmm. We know, even after salvation, as we walk in this, as we, before we have cast off the mortal coil, so to speak, we still struggle with sin. Paul is saying, though, you have changed as a person and you no longer abide with it. Your relationship to sin has changed completely. <clears throat> Excuse me. And for that reason, it's sort of why uh, being without Jesus, uh, being without Jesus, sin comes from the fact that sin is reigning over you. Remember I said, you must sin. It is inevitable that you will sin and you enjoy the sin because at the core of your being, you desire it. At the core of your being, that is what the sinful nature does to you. It corrupts your conscience. It corrupts your being. It makes you something that God, uh, God must judge rather than God can walk with. Yeah. <clears throat> we see from 521, sin, uh, sin reigned in death. That is to say, sin reigned over dead people who can do nothing but continue to be dead. An illustration, another illustration, along with the, the boulder from earlier, uh, try to convince a cadaver to walk. Mm-hmm. Now, I didn't say, like, make a cadaver walk. I said try to convince a cadaver to walk. First and foremost, you just sort of, excuse me, dead on arrival, in that you uh, it can't hear you. You can't convince a cadaver to walk. It has, no, it has no way of taking in the information you're giving it and using that to produce action in itself. Very well. Very good. If you're very committed... And you and your buddy are really committed, you could potentially pick up the cadaver and sort of like walk it around with you. Uh, However, I think even in this illustration, it sort of falls flat, if you will, because as soon as you stop supporting the cadaver, what does it do? This is the old life. This is the old life that is being talked about here. It is defined by death. When you are living life under the reign of sin, sinning is natural, it is constant, it is habitual, it is just what you do. To err is human is, is, is a phrase for a reason. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, any chance you have, any change rather, any change that you have in your life is going to be fleeting. It's going to be uh, insubstantial. It's not going to last because it goes against your very nature of being a sinner. Uh, I think kicking an addiction, helping someone in need, loving anything more than yourself, these things are impossible to do for long stretches of time because of your sinful nature until that is removed. And again, people, non-Christians, people who are not saved can do good things. You know, Paul talks about how Gentiles or Gentiles keep the law better than you do sometimes. Um, this is not to say that it's impossible for someone to do something that is in accordance with the will of God, even without being a Christian. It's to say that it's they still abide with sin and that change or that good cannot last and it cannot be eternal because Mm -hmm. the sin uh, reigns. Yes. So rather than, excuse me, rather than taking on an impossible task, that is to say convincing a cadaver to walk or convincing someone who has not had the sinful nature extracted from them, in order to convince a cadaver to walk, it must change from being a cadaver. It must be not a cadaver. You were a cadaver, and then God breathed life into you. And now, it's not to say that you should be. It's that you are. You are a person walking. Amen. You are a person walking free Amen. from the reign of sin. Yeah. Not free from the effects of sin, but free from the reign of sin. That, that sin is reigning over you and saying, you must do this. You must act against the Lord. Now, when a living person walks freely, are they going to stumble? Absolutely. Absolutely, we're going to stumble. But you have the power now, by God's Holy Spirit in you, to keep yourself up off the ground. You can catch yourself when you stumble. You can stumble, fall to the ground, and know that God can pick you back up and you can keep on walking with him. Rather than the good in your life being temporary and the sin being constant, 
It's the blessing of God is now promised as a constant because you are a changed person with relation to sin. And the sin, the sinning, the sins, plural, those are the ones that have to beat into you and, 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 and run counter to your very nature, which has changed. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so now we have, you know, you have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? So we have, we have this, uh, this idea of death. Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> you think, well, if, I, if I'm dying, I'm still dead. So I don't really understand how this makes sense. But again, we have sin reigned in death. Mm -hmm. And so to die to death would mean to... It's the opposite of the dying thing. It's, 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 a, it's a double negative. So the, to die to death means to live. Paul gets into that here. It's mathematics. It's mathematics. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> What's the derivative of sin, people? No, anyway. Um, <clears throat> so we have the old life. And then we have Paul talking about the new death. As we move into uh, verse 3. We're going to read verse 3 in the first half of verse 4. So we have the end of verse 2. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Verse 3. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death. So we have the old life, now we have the new death. Interestingly, this is actually the only two times baptism comes up in Romans, uh, as in these two verses. Clearly, uh, the, the, the Roman Christians were not actually having an issue with this. Unlike some of the other, uh, <laughs> some of the other uh, people Paul wrote to. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> so we have another rhetorical question here, which is, or don't you know that uh, all of you who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Baptism is, as, as we know, as we think about it, is the, the immersion in water in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit and the bringing out of, out of the water uh, that's the illustration, that is, to illustrate being buried with Christ and rising with Christ. So to be baptized uh, actually has even more implications uh, theologically and spiritually than simply that act. To be baptized into something means to be placed from one context into a new context, placed from one environment into a new environment. <clears throat> So that's what it baptized into Christ's death. We are now taken from the environment we were in, which is sinful by nature and holding a sinful nature and being sinners. And we are moved and placed into the new environment that is sharing in Christ's death, sharing in the death of Jesus. Okay, so we got that. What does that mean? How does that work? <clears throat> so we have to die to something. If we are dead to sin... It means to be separated from it. Uh, to die to life means to, you know, die, to, to no longer be living. To die spiritually uh, means to be separate from God. Um, to die to sin means to be separate from sin. So that's where we are right here. And again, I want to be clear. Paul is not saying that the actual act of baptism is what does this. He is, he is using baptism as an illustration for what happens to a person's spirit upon, uh, a person's being upon uh, Salvation. Very good. <clears throat> so being baptized into Christ's death, it is being placed into the context, placed into the environment of Christ's death. <clears throat> Excuse me. The dying to sin and the changing of environment are both necessary for the removal of the reign of sin over you, mm -hmm. okay? So you think about uh, your, your engagement, your relationship to sin being one of sort of cordial reign over you. Uh, you're in the kingdom of sin, so to speak. The only way out of that, uh, lest you be called, <laughs> be treasonous, is to die. So you must die, and then you are, you know, a, person, a dead person cannot be reigned over, and so they, you, are, you are removed from that, uh, from, from, from that obligation to the sinful nature. Good. Now, God also promises to raise us to life again. Now, if he raises us to life in the same context we were in, still in the sinful, in the sinful kingdom, 
And what good is it? Sure, we, were, we died and we were, no longer, uh, we were no longer a part of that sinful kingdom for a time, and then we were raised again and we're right back into it. No, 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 no. Baptized into Christ's death. Moved. Our environment is moved. We are moved from the kingdom of sin uh, at our death and then placed and raised somewhere else, somewhere new, somewhere that is always separate from sin. We are baptized into Christ's death. Christ's death itself defeats sin. And so by being raised there, by being baptized, by moved into there, we cast off our, our, uh, our relationship to sin, and when we are given new life, it is somewhere else. It, is, it remains separate. The walls that Christ builds around us uh, keep out the, the sinful kingdom, so to speak. Both of these things are achieved in the baptism of Christ. So, to escape the reign of sin, you must die to it. And what does that mean? What does that mean like dying, dying to sin? How does one go about that? The first five chapters of Romans are all about this, guys. That's why we've been spending so much time on it. Recognizing what sin is and what sin does to you. That shows you your need for a savior. And the Lord acts on that and gives you grace. The Lord shows you what you are and says, this, you, are, you are under my judgment if you remain here. But he welcomes you and brings you into his kingdom, into, into, the, in, in, into, into, his, into relationship with him through the death of his son. Amen. So the recognition is the first part. The second part, obviously, recognizing that you don't have the power to defeat sin by yourself. You'll notice he doesn't say here, you know, and by working really hard, you, you move your context. He yes. says only by the baptism into the death of Christ, the act of Christ. Pastor Bob talked about it last week. The act of Christ in obedience is what brings about the reign of life. <clears throat> so where were you at your root prior to this change of person? Well, you, I, there are three phrases that drive me insane. Uh, but they're very common today. Um, do what makes you happy. You do you. And we're the ones we were waiting for. That one's my, maybe not quite as common, but I, I hear it in, frequently enough that it drives me nuts. So do what makes you happy. What does that say? What does that mean? It means that the main motivation you should have is anything that brings you fleeting emotional satisfaction. Yeah. It means whatever I'm feeling in a moment, and we know from scripture the heart is a fickle thing, Whatever I'm feeling in the moment, that is dictating what is the most important thing for me to do right now. Mm -hmm. yes. You do you. Very similar to the first one, but different in this. You do you essentially means I'm accountable only to myself. Mm. It does not matter what anyone around me thinks or will be harmed by. It does not, I, I, I am not accountable to them, and even more, worse than that, I am not accountable to anything above me. I'm not accountable to the great judge of God. And the last one, we're the ones we've been waiting for. This one is very, it's like the, 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 uh, the bumper sticker for secular humanism. Um, essentially, it means we as human beings, as we are currently, have the power to fix the world. That's what it means. We're the ones we've been waiting for. We finally get what's wrong with, with all of humanity and we can fix it with usually lots of government oversight. Yeah, no. That's I not true. Like this. Now... What was that, Josh? I, said, I thought it was like the 60s that they had it figured out. <laughs> Peace, man. <laughs> For those on Zoom, Josh said he thought it was the 60s. We had it all figured out. <laughs> when Jesus died for you, he brought you with him to die to these things, to these mentalities, these ideas of... Do what makes you happy. You do you. We're the ones we've been waiting for. And these are just examples of, of some of the, like what the sinful nature does to you at your core. Obviously, we can think of many more motivations and, and wicked things that we see around us. <clears throat> we know now, we can see, our eyes have been opened now, that the heart is a fickle thing. And what makes you happy today makes no guarantees for tomorrow, unlike the Lord your God, who makes guarantees for eternity. We know that you are accountable not only to your fellow humans, but to the great judge and God and sustainer and creator above. We are, we are accountable to each other and to him. Yes. And we know that the, first, the very first sin 
was believing that we could make a better world than God could. We are dead to these lies, and we have become separate from sin by the grace of Jesus, who died for us while we still clung to those lies. Mm-hmm. So, you know, why? <clears throat> so we've talked a little bit about being baptized into Christ's death and becoming separate from sin, but I think oftentimes we, you know, have, as we work that out in practice, if that's where we stop, if that's where we end, then we as Christians are just known for the things that we, dis- that we have hold disdain for. We're known for the things that we dislike. We're known for the things that we're against rather than the things that we are uh, you know, striving for. Yes. If we are going to remove, do what makes you happy as like the, the core element to, our, to, to, to a person, what's going in there in its place? Otherwise, it's just a void. So, brothers and sisters, I said that baptism changed your environment to join in Christ's death. And that death separates us from sin. Something else that Christ's death was, was temporary. Very good. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Picking up in verse 4. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death. And here's that phrase, in order that. Because... We were therefore buried, uh, sorry, buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So that we may live a new life. Excuse me. We know that the old life no longer has hold over us. We are no, it is no longer uh, that we must sin, Right? It is no longer that it is inevitable that we will sin. We know that the new death has separated us from that sinful nature and opened our eyes to what what, what it actually is. So we we no longer must sin. We no longer want to sin at our core. Mm -hmm. And so now we see why. What's filling in that gap? That we may walk in the new life with God. Mm -hmm. We were cadavers and now we walk with God. Amen. <clears throat> All this to say, we were joined. We are. Jo- we are joined. Rather, we are joined once again with the Father in heaven, the Sustainer, the Creator, the, the, the Lover of creation, by the power of the Holy Spirit through the sacrifice of the Son. If you ever needed a, a lesson in Trinitarian, uh, how, how that works, just read Romans. <laughs> This is the new life. We are joined again with the Father by the power of the Holy Spirit through the sacrifice of the Son. This is the new life. Paul has not even really begun to talk about, like, specifically, what do you now do with the new life? How do you live? Uh, What what, what particular actions are very holy and what particular actions are very very bad? Uh, Rather, this is the, he's emphasizing that your personhood has changed. You are a changed person, a changed vessel, not a vessel of wrath any longer that will be, that will be taking the the cup of God's wrath poured out over you, but rather a vessel of grace that God will pour more and more grace into your life. Amen. As we said earlier, new action prior to new personhood is impossible. It's like moving the cadaver. But when the cadaver is changed into something new, what, what can it now walk towards? <clears throat> so like I said, ultimately this passage is about God altering who we are at our core. Those three phrases that I had or I had earlier, do what makes you happy. Rather than that, and again, we don't want to just say that's not how it is. We want to say, rather, this is how it is. Rather than do what makes you happy, I can say, I do what brings glory to God. Amen. Rather than you do you, you're accountable to no one, I can say, my God has reconciled to me and I can put others before myself. Praise God. We are the ones we've been waiting for. We're the ones who have it all figured out. Rather than that, I can say, Jesus is the one that I have been waiting for. 
<laughs> Jesus is the one who has it figured yeah. out. God is the one who has, who has laid out for us what it is to walk with him. Yeah. And I want that. Amen. That's what we can say today. Praise God. Because of what the Lord has done. When we are saved by Christ, our lives change. This is not a, our lives should change. This is our lives change. Our eyes are open to the lies of sin. And more than that, our eyes are open to the glory of our God. We are able to say no to sin. Because we no longer must sin. We no longer want to sin. We're able to say no to sin. <clears throat> and in, so, in doing so, we will stumble, like I've talked about. I want to make that very clear. This is not a matter of we will, we will never sin ever again. Sin is still in the world. Sin will always be there to try to tempt you into letting, to opening the gates to the city, so to speak, to let it gain a, a small foothold here and there, but it will never abide with you again. It will never reign in your life with Christ's blood covering you. We can say no to it. More than that, we can say yes to what God has for us. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, God, use me to bring your name glory. Yes, God, I will love my wife and children before myself. Yes, God, I will care for my neighbor. Yes, God, I will lift your praises high into the heavens. Amen. I no longer fear your judgment, but I relish your friendship. Mm. Yes, God. I will walk in the newness of life that you provide. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we say yes to you. More than, more than, more than anything else, we, want, we, 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 we seek to say yes to you. You have changed us to our, in our very being. You have brought us out of darkness. You have brought us out of the reign of sin into new life. What you have for us from here on, Lord... Uh, you, you, you reveal to us day in and day out as we, as we seek you in prayer, as we seek you in fellowship, as we seek you in your word. Lord, you have opened our eyes to what scripture has to say to us. You've opened our eyes to the, the privilege it is to enter your throne room in prayer. And you've opened our eyes to a desire, a want, and a need for these things in our lives, for your presence in our lives that you have promised and that you, you continue to bear out in our lives. Lord, you've changed us. And we know that your promise is to change all things, to bring glory back to yourself. We lift up a New Hope Christian Fellowship, Lord, that we would be a place that, that can say, yes, God, I will. Yes. And that the, the change that has taken place in each individual life here would be reflected to the community, would be, would be reflected to Bedford and Manchester and beyond. And Lord, that you would draw more and more hearts to you to say, yes, I want you in my life. Yes, I, am, I was a cadaver, and now I walk with the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You are good and mighty, and you will bring all things to pass to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> We're going to sing a new song. Rather, uh, Pastor Bob is going to, to sing most of it because I'm still learning it. We're singing it again ne uh, next week in the, as the first song. <clears throat>